Welcome, bienvenidos to today's core training on developing a theory of change and logic model with an equity lens. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments along with Nicole Young, and we're your host today. Today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and she'll also translate written comments and questions in the chat. Soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation, which is provided by Stella Lauerman. I'll turn it over to Nicole Young, who's going to give us a brief overview of CORE. Thanks, Nicole. So again, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, and it's both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And CORE has evolved over several years now based on input and insights that we've gathered along the way from many partners in local government, philanthropy, nonprofits, and community groups. And this collaborative process uh, over the many years has led to this core mission and vision statement that we're showing on the slide with equity at the center. And so this will be a recurring theme, equity at the center, equity, equitable health and well-being. So when we say equitable health and well-being, we really mean that we want to live in a community where all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being, so that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by things like race or ethnicity, income level, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or other dimensions of our social identities. So that means that when we think of CORE as both a funding model and a broader movement toward equitable health and well-being, CORE Investments really provides a framework to align priorities and programs and policies and funding and results around community-wide goals and then work together to create the CORE conditions for health and well-being. And equity is very intentionally placed at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to continuously examine and address our individual our organizational and our systemic beliefs and practices and structures, because they're often the very things that perpetuate the inequities that we're trying to eliminate. And I just want to highlight a couple things because again, particularly in these um, trainings and TA sessions that we're offering related to the core investments request for proposals or RFP, um, equity is going to be a recurring theme, and we really want to help make sure that applicants are aware of what this means, how it's being defined and talked about in our county, so that you can really uh, make sure to be addressing that clearly in, in your proposals. So you might know that the County Board of Supervisors adopted this equity statement, um, I think just a few months ago. So the statement is, equity in action in Santa Cruz County is a transformative process that embraces individuals of every status, providing unwavering support, dignity, and compassion. And through this commitment, the county ensures intentional opportunities and access, fostering an environment where everyone can thrive and belong. So as you can see, some key words in there that really align well with the core investments, mission, vision, um, and the core conditions. Then on the next slide, you'll see also, and this comes from the recently released RFP. There's a glossary in the at the back of the document. This is how they're defining equity in the RFP glossary. Fairness or justice in the way people are treated, specifically freedom from bias or favoritism. And a program that's built on equity will address the needs of specific populations that are most likely to be affected by inequities by providing resources and opportunities such that they may thrive alongside other residents in the county. So again, we realize there may be lots of different ways of defining equity, different ways of thinking it, about it, but um, we thought, especially since this training is being offered as part of the support as applicants are preparing their um, core grant applications, we wanted to make sure that you're aware of these two statements and, and the definitions. 
And then speaking of today's training, this is offered as part of the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact, which is what we think of as the learning arm of core investments, where we offer an array of training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities to really try to build capacity among people across sectors, helping everyone build the knowledge, the skills, and the systems that are needed to fulfill that collective vision of an equi equitable, thriving, resilient community. And as you know, and it's probably largely what brought you here today, the County of Santa Cruz and the City of Santa Cruz just released the core investments request for proposals or RFP on June 3rd, so earlier this week, and applications are due by 5 p.m. on August 2nd. So even though we're not going to be covering the details today of the RFP, and we'll actually encourage you if you have questions about the document, the requirements, all that, we'll actually encourage you to sign up for the applicants conference on June 21st or send your questions to the core funding email address. And we'll show you that in a moment. Uh, but we did want to make sure that everyone here is aware of some key pieces of information, like where to find the RFP. So you can find it, the actual document on the county's website. It's the general services department. So that's the image that you see on the left side of the slide. So this this is a site you, that you want to look to, to to know, okay, what's officially been posted or changed? If there's been any amendments, that's the site you want to go to. Uh, but the General Services Department's webpage only provides the link to download the RFP and tells you if there have been any um, amendments. So HSD, the Human Services Department, has also set up a webpage specifically for this three-year core investments funding cycle, fiscal years 2025 through 2028. Their website is a little bit of an easier kind of one-stop shop for to find all the information and documents that you need, including the RFP, the budget template, all, all of those things. So Gisela has posted those links in the chat. And then again, just if you have questions about those actual documents or the timelines or anything like that, send an email to corefunding at santacruzcountyca.gov. That goes to um, the team at, at the Human Services Department. The next thing we'll highlight are just some of the key dates to be aware of. Um, so again, RFP was, was released uh, on Monday of this week. Today is the first day that we're really offering, officially offering training and technical assistance related to the RFP. We'll be doing that through the whole application period up through August 2nd. Um, if you don't, again, if you haven't already uh, registered, um, you should uh, register for the applicant conference on June 21st. Even if you don't think you can attend it live, we'll um, send the recording. So it'll just help to know who's interested in that uh, to make sure that you get the, the follow-up email with that information. There is a deadline to submit written questions to that core funding email address. So any questions that HSD receives by July 1st, they will address and uh, include in a, in a document they post on their website. Um, I think within about a week after that. We're not entirely sure what happens to questions that get submitted after July 1st. We will try to get clarification on that um, and make sure that that's addressed in the applicants conference, but just know that um, there will be some official kind of Q&A postings on HSD's website. And then again, applications due August 2nd by 5 p.m. Couple more things about the RFP. Uh, you may have noticed if you if you have had a chance to read it that for this funding cycle, the board and the city council are inviting proposals that address specific core conditions and related impact statements. So for this funding cycle, the uh, three core conditions that are prioritized in the RFP are lifelong learning and education. And the impact statement that goes along with that is equitable access to high quality education and learning opportunities. The next core condition is thriving families. There are two impact statements that are prioritized in this RFP, increased resilience of children and youth and increased resilience among older and dependent adults. And then the third core condition is healthy environments, the impact statement being safe, affordable, accessible recreation spaces. There will be a separate process that the county will go through to award funds in the stable affordable housing and shelter core condition but that's gonna be handled outside of the current RFP that was just released. And we don't actually have any additional details about that. So th that would definitely be a question to send to that core funding address if you are wondering how that's gonna happen. 
But what we can offer, what we are here to do is to offer training and technical assistance related to this RFP. That that will be our main focus over the next couple of months in terms of core institute offerings. So Nicole Lezen, our colleague, Crystal Caballero, uh, and I are providing training and technical assistance or TA again throughout this application period. Our role really is to provide, again, the training, some tools, some guidance to help applicants understand some of the key concepts and tools that are mentioned in the RFP, things like collective impact, the core conditions, uh, some tools you'll hear more about, like the core continuum of results and evidence, equity, and how to design a theory of change and logic model to support your planning. So during the trainings and TA sessions, just know that we're going to be actively staying away from making suggestions or trying to give you advice that lead you toward making certain decisions about, you know, what to apply for or whether to apply or what services you should include in your proposals. Um, it's not really our role to provide that kind of guidance because if we're wrong, we don't want to be um we don't want to be wrong and have you pay the price for that. So instead, we're here to share information and tools and resources. You might find that we'll ask you a lot of questions just you know after you ask us questions um, so that we can help really coach and guide you to arrive at your own answers and feel like you've got some solid tools and even some um, places to look to to get some uh, other examples or sample language that could help you out. If you do during the training have a question that really it just requires a simple clarification, like, you know, help point me in the right direction in the RFP in terms of where something is. We'll do our best to answer that or talk you through, we'll talk it through it as a group. Um, you know, and, and if it seems like the training is the right place to address those, we can do that. But uh, again, you might find that there are times when we'll just say, you know what, that's a good question for the county, send that to the core funding email address. And also we just want to clarify, we will not be involved at all in identifying or selecting the review panels. We won't be reading or scoring any applications. We're not involved in any of the discussions or decisions about the funding recommendations because we really want to focus on how to best support the applicants. Uh, we do have a colleague, Jane Conklin, who is another men member of our core consulting team. She will be providing support to HSD and the city in that part of the uh, review process but we're actually keeping some pretty clear boundaries and separations between her role and what Nicole, Crystal, and I will be doing so that we're not having anything to do with the funding recommendations. And okay, so I we've just, got to- I just add Nicole and clarify that that's also what was true in the last cycle. Yes, yes. And so what we're here to do is offer a variety of um, structured trainings. They will all be bilingual, recorded, shared afterwards, like today's training. We also are offering um, a, a few different office hour sessions that are more informal, meaning we're not gonna come with the presentation. It's really, you come to us if you have questions, you're applying under a certain core condition, you want help thinking through something um, that, you know, so they'll just be really informal and just kind of use that time in whatever way is useful. Um, and there might be multiple people from different organizations attending those. For those office hours sessions, we will only provide interpretation if it's requested in advance, um, and those will not be recorded and not shared afterwards, because we want people to be able to speak freely about what they're thinking about with their proposals without <laughs> worrying about like, oh, everybody's going to see it now on a, on a recording. Um, and then we are also offering more individualized TA sessions, up to two sessions per applicant or per application. Uh, where if you want some really specific and more tailored guidance and opportunity to, to talk with one of us, uh, there's a way to do that. We'll, we'll say more at the end about how you can sign up for all of that. Those will be in English, again, unless interpretation is requested in advance, also not recorded. Okay, um, I'm going to move us on, and I do see a question in the chat about the budget allocation for each core condition. I'm going to hold off on answering that um, since it is a specific question about the RFP. If we have time at the end of today, we'll we'll come back and um, try to address that one. Uh, but it is spelled out in the in the RFP. Okay, so that's our little overview of what we're here for, what our role is, and what we'd like to do before we dive into our training on theories of change and logic models. I actually want to start off with an opening poll, just to get a sense 
from those of you in the room, there's two questions in this poll. How would you rate your current level of knowledge about developing a theory of change? Would you say it's none, little, some, or a lot? And then same question about how would you rate your level of knowledge about developing a logic model? Is it none, a little, some, or a lot? We'll give everyone a moment to, to think about it. Submit your answers before we share the results and move on. Some of you, I think, might have gone through this training with us in the past. So hopefully you're not some of the ones saying that you have none. <laughs> Your level of knowledge is none. But also we're big believers in uh, there's always more to learn, always more to practice. And let me just see, are, are, are folks able to see the, the poll on your screens? Can someone, um, maybe a participant, can someone either come off mute or give me a thumbs up? Are you able to see the poll or is it? I cannot see it. Oh. I, I see the poll, but not the, the results. I mean, I see the original poll for us. To respond not, to? Yeah, but not the results, if that's what you meant. I, I haven't shown the results yet because I don't see that anyone has responded to you. That's, um, so I'm wondering. Oh, if I responded. Yeah. Nicole, I'm seeing responses. Oh, you are? Oh. Yeah. I wonder if it's a co-host weirdness of some kind. Okay. Well, then I am going to, Do you want me to end, end the poll so that okay. I can share the results and let's see what we've got here. So I will be. Okay. So are you seeing results? <laughs> I still see nothing. Oh, how weird. Okay. Do you want to, do you want to try uh, sharing, Nicole? I think Peggy, Peggy's saying she's seen it, but yeah, I'll share. I see it also. I see it. Yep. Nicole, okay. I see it too. Well, Everybody that's except good. Nicole Young is seeing, seeing it's like <laughs> It's the biggest secret. It is a big <laughs> secret, but we've got a nice little, um, little mini bell curve here. I was just going to say, I'll spoil it and say there's no mucho. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So sounds like a little bit of a bell curve, which means that we uh, have, have got some room to learn. And did, was there anybody that said none? There, Yes. Okay. There were, um, there was one none about the theory of change and a couple for logic models. Okay. Well, then you were all in the right place. We're, we're so glad to have you here. So why don't we go ahead and move on? I'll, I'll tell you a bit about what we're planning to do today in terms of our agenda. So we just finished the overview of CORE. We're gonna break this training into really two main chunks, developing a theory of change and then developing a logic model. And then we'll finish and in each of those sections we'll have a chance to, uh, or you'll have a chance to try practicing this and just see how far you get. And then we'll finish with uh, questions and next steps. And I'll just say that, um, when Gisela just posted a link in the chat that has a Google folder where you'll find kind of the, the it's, there's still kind of a working draft of the slides um, and some of the handouts and the templates that we'll review later. We will send kind of the final versions of all these out when we share the recording. We still have to do some work to make sure that they're all uh, ADA accessible. But if you want to follow along, the materials are in the Google Drive. And we're gonna be covering a lot today. And so if you feel like, wow, this is going too fast, or I, I need more time to really think about how I'm gonna apply this, that would be a great use of the office hours and the TA sessions. So just know that like, 
we ex fully expect that you will leave here uh, with maybe more questions than you came with um, and uh, maybe needing more guidance. So let's start with developing a theory of change with an equity lens. And we like to start with a little bit of humor. This is a cartoon cartoon sketch that uh, is done by this other person, Chris Lisi, Lisi, um, uh, from Fresh Spectrum. And so this, so uh, Chris is the person that came up with this, and basically saying, um, "This is what it can seem like when it's not clear what the purpose or impact of a program is. That without evaluation, which helps you tell a clear, compelling story about the difference you're making." Funding requests can often be experienced like this, like, please give us money. There's a big black, back, big, big black box where the magic happens. And I know you can't see what's inside that box, but trust us, the magic happens and just give us more money. Um, and many times, conversely, nonprofits that are seeking funding from different funders can often feel like they're experiencing a similar black box. Like it's hard to know exactly what funders or even donors are interested in funding and what makes a funding request stand out. So we're really gonna try to make things as clear, as transparent uh, as possible. And so really think of this as the issue isn't whether your agencies are doing good, good work or valuable work. It's really a matter of how can you, as you're preparing grant applications, um, best communicate about the magic of what you do, do, and then the kinds of results you're getting. So that's where a theory of change and a logic model can help. Uh, and so this is where, so these are some of the hands up that we shared in the uh, reminder email I sent out and in the link that Gisela just shared. Again, we're going to start with the theory of change. Um, if you had a chance to print a blank copy of the worksheet, um, that I sent in the, in the reminder email, that'll be great. You might find that useful during the practice. Um, same thing with the logic model template, but also know that those documents are there for you to just use on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. Do want to say one thing that sometimes the terms logic model and theory of change are, are used interchangeably. Don't worry too much today about making a distinction between the two. Um, depending on your program or your experience, you may also find that you have different starting points. When they don't, require that from you when you're applying for funds, but the more clearly that you are able to articulate how and why your activities and services lead to these changes in outcomes, the easier it is for others to choose to invest time and their resources and their relationships in, in your program. So in other words, you're, you're revealing the magic that's in that black box that, that was in the, um, the cartoon that Nicole shared. Nicole, are you back? I am. Oh my goodness, that okay. was <laughs> okay. So, when we're talking about a theory of change, um, it's really it's a way to help um, you or or a group of you that are working to really define a problem or a need that you're uh, seeing that needs to be addressed the context or kind of your understanding of why that issue or that that need exists, and then your proposed solutions. And really it's kind of your hypothesis about why a particular program or service is needed. So throughout the process of developing a theory of change, it's good at every step of the way to be thinking and asking yourselves, what data do you have or will you need to support your theory of change? And so if we start with this first section here, the problem or the need, think of this as you're describing, you're kind of starting at the biggest level. What is that kind of societal, societal or social problem or need that you think needs to be addressed? And who is experiencing it or who is affected by it? And then this is where you start to weave in that equity lens. Are some people affected more than others? by that societal or social problem or need. That's where we, that's what we mean by inequities or disparities. So that's really what we're talking about when, we, when we're saying identify or describe the problem or need. And then on the next slide, you'll see an example. We started to, um, we just drafted some sample language. This is this is the language that's actually in that handout with the, with the fully fleshed theory of change example. Uh, so we're just showing you kind of the snippets on the slide here. I will say that um, uh, 
this might look, wow, that's so polished. And if only it were that easy to write something like this. So just know that, you know, Nicole Lezen is a professional writer and grant writer, <laughs> excellent at what she does. Uh, we've, but we've both spent a lot of time, uh, you know, developing, refining this, this training. So we know that it's not going to be as easy as we're making it look on the slides. You might find that you need to do lots and lots of kind of refining and editing and where you start is just like maybe writing down a few bullet points and that is okay. Like you start with that. So don't get intimidated. If you see examples on these slides and you think, ah, oh, yeah, that would take too long. But we want to just show like kind of add, the way you go about this. Yeah, I would just add Nicole to that point that when you might land on something that you think is perfect and then you show it to somebody else internally or externally and they are scratching their head over it, doesn't make sense to them. And that's actually one of the reasons this is valuable is yes. that what you think is totally clear and self-evident about any aspect of the things we're discussing may or may not be to others. So it's a great way to test that assumption. Is this as obvious to others as it is to me? Yes, exactly. So here's the example, healthy eating and physical activity habits in childhood contribute to lifelong health benefits while unhealthy habits increase the chances of developing health problems like obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, right? So it's more like a, you're just kind of objectively stating what the problem or need is that you've identified. And then that continues on. So here's how you might describe who's affected and what inequities uh, are, are visible. So in Santa Cruz County, the rates of students who are at a healthy weight and physically fit are at or above state averages overall, but not for every group of students. In our county, Latino or Latin kids are less likely to be at a healthy weight or physically fit. And so you might ask, well, how do you know that? And that's where you would want to uh, be looking at data. And so on the next slide, you'll see an example that has some placeholders and things that you would actually you know, want to make sure are, are filled in and updated, but you might then want to show. So for example, in a particular year, about 51% of Latino fifth graders are at a healthy weight compared to 76% of white students. So just want to explain that um, this data point we we just discovered <laughs> used to be on data share and it actually was a, a real data point. And then um, the data source was discontinued. And so it's actually not a, a, a live data point anymore. Um, but we did want to still point out that there are that data share is a great source for community level data. And we'll show that in just a second. So that was uh, describing the problem or needs statement. Now you wanna be able to say more about the context. You know, what are your assumptions about why that problem or need exists? What are the causes or contributing factors, which may include uh, systemic barriers that it's not all about individual choices, right? That oftentimes, again, it's the uh, systemic barriers, things like systemic racism that have created the inequities and disparities. And we also want to point out this is a this is a really good place to not only look at the problems and the causes, but to be able to identify and describe strengths, assets, and protective factors to build off of. Strengths, assets, protective factors of individuals, of families, of a community. It helps um, shift that focus to more of that strengths-based approach versus a deficit-based approach. Um, this is where uh, having, again, data uh, can really help strengthen the case that you're trying to make in terms of uh, what the level of need is. And so this is where if you're looking for kind of community level data, population level data, the core results menu on data share is one tool that we'll actually cover in a number of other uh, upcoming trainings but it's a tool that can be a really helpful place for finding data, particularly knowing that um, this RFP is prioritizing applications that focus on certain core conditions. So Nicole's gonna switch over for just a second and show just for any of you who may not have explored the core results menu very much yet, we'll show you what it looks like 
how to get there. So this is the data share platform. There's a section in the menu called local progress. And so you'll find the core results menu at the very top of that menu there that appears. Yeah, core results menu. When Nicole clicks on that, you'll see this is this is what we call the core results menu. It, it's housed on data share that lists each of the eight core conditions and the associated impact statements for each one of them. So you'll see, for instance, in the lifelong learning and education core condition, that impact statement, equitable access to high quality education and learning opportunities, that's the one that's being prioritized or one of the ones that's being prioritized in this current RFP. So if you click on that, you can see the kinds of data that, that are available and that exist on data share, uh, some of which you might find, again, helpful in creating your problem or need statement as well as describing the context. Okay, so again, there will be more trainings on how to use the core results menu, how to find other data, uh, but now let's switch back to the slides and continue with how to build your theory of change. So here are some examples of, again, using this, sticking with the same example of childhood obesity as the, the problem or the need or the issue that we're focusing on. Now, if we're look, thinking about, okay, what are some of the causes, contributing factors, systemic factors to childhood obesity? It might be things like lack of access to healthy or healthier choices, um, whether that's food deserts or that free and low cost food choices are often less healthy. Um, causes or contributing factors could be economic insecurity, just the difficulty of changing habits, maybe a lack of support from friends and family. So it could be a number of things. And again, at this point, it's still kind of hypothesis, but then you would want to be looking at again, how, where and how might you find data that either helps support that or um, yeah, kind of validates what your theory is. Then on the next slide, you'll see some examples of, again, how you might think about strengths and assets and protective factors. Um, maybe you've noticed that there's an increased interest in among community members in growing their own food. So things like community gardens and native foods that maybe there's, um, uh, in terms of a strength or a protective factor or, a, or a, a, even a possibility, making the healthy choice, the easy and affordable choice through things like school meals or vending options or having walking trails and parks uh, readily accessible and safe. Another strength or asset could be just encouragement from, from friends and family. So you're basically looking at, are these things that we feel like exist, that there are signs of those that are things to build off of um, in a program or a service? And then there's, you know, looking at community level data, you know, through things like data show, you can see, okay, what, what data already exists that tells you more about this problem or need, but then you might also find, oh, we, we actually need some additional data as well to really understand from a youth perspective or community perspective, what the need or um, solutions should be. So you might identify that you need additional focus group data from, from local students, or you need to look into research studies in other communities. And once you've gathered all of that, then you're really able to ready to start thinking about the solutions. What is your hypothesis about effective strategies, programs, and practices? What are the things that actually will um, uh, address and solve that problem or need that you identified in the beginning of your theory of change? And again, what data do you have or will you need? And so again, we'll show some examples of how you might think about this or how you might start to write a solution statement. So here's the hypothesis. If we make the healthy choice, the easy or easier and affordable choice, we can encourage healthy eating and physical activity and improve outcomes for all local youth while closing disparities in outcomes. And maybe you have an opportunity to work with a group of students who are motivated to change behaviors among their peers and push for better policies in their school, neighborhood, and community. So that might then be kind of like the beginnings of your program or service, or it might be then your way of, this, of articulating, here's why our program or service is needed. And again, you might have to think about what, what data do you have? What data do you need? And that's um, on the next slide, that's what's showing. Okay. So we wanna 
give you a little bit of time to try it yourself. So on the next slide, you'll see just kind of the high level view of those components of a theory of change. And again, um, really you're trying to uh, answer that question, like, why are you doing <laughs> what you, or why do you think something, a program or service is needed that you're proposing? So if you have the template um, that we sent out an email or that's um, in that Google folder, the what the blank template with the theory of change that really asks some of those prompting questions about the problem or need, the context and solutions. Um, get that, get that out. Take, we're going to take about five minutes just to have you jot down some notes. That, again, they don't have to be fully fleshed out sentences. Just jot down some notes based on what you um, saw and heard me review just now. And I'll just add the solutions may not be something that you come up with from scratch and that you're designing on the fly. They might be something that you've read that works elsewhere or heard about or want to try. I mean, there's a the whole universe of solutions is not just on your shoulders to come up with in these five minutes or ever. Okay, so we'll give you about five minutes and then we'll just do a quick check to see how that went for you and if anyone wants to share an example of something and they wrote down. Okay, why don't we just check in to see, did anyone have any luck giving it a try? There are certain sections of your, of the theory of change that and it easier to jot down some things versus other areas where you thought, oh, I'd have to really spend more time thinking about that and thinking about it with others as well. Does anyone already have a theory of change? for your program that this might make you think differently about or is it aligns with? Okay, well, we're gonna leave it up to you. If you think of questions, feel free to, to uh, come off mute and ask them or put them in the chat. Um, but because we still have another uh, chunk to go through, why don't we go ahead and move on to logic models and then we'll circle back to see um, what other questions or ideas Sounds people have good. at the end. Okay, we'll do that. So moving on to logic models. So we, we know from the poll we took earlier, there's a, a, um, some of you have a little bit of experience with logic models. Some of you have no experience with them. Um, and again, this is something that can seem more complicated than it really is. Um, so let's walk through some of the, the pieces of it. You can make logic models as simple or as complicated as you want them to be. The simplest way is to just start asking a series of if-then questions like this. If we have these resources, which in logic model world are called inputs, to do these activities, which are also known as outputs, for these participants who are another type of output, then we can expect or we want or we hope to see these short-term, intermediate, and long-term changes. So when you're creating a logic model this way, you're completing an answer to the question, what are you doing and why? It's also a helpful way to think through the specific activities that you think will lead to changes or results. So you're, you're helping to explain that to others. We're gonna walk through each of the building blocks of a logic model, and we'll highlight some examples along the way. And just like we did with the theory of change, then we'll have some time to practice filling one out. So let's start with inputs. And again, this is just, another way of talking about resources. They might be resources that you already have in place, like your excellent staff and volunteers. Um, they might be things that you hope to have, like more funds, um, a new partnership perhaps, 
um, an upgrade of technology or access to a certain kind of training that would help you advance what you're trying to do. So they're just the things that you want to have in place, some of which you already have and some of which you're seeking that will make all these other parts of the logic model possible. And then you're taking those inputs or resources and allocating them to get something done, right? So in this case, there are activities or in, in logic model language, the outputs of the, the, the inputs are the resources and the outputs are the things that those lead to. So they could be activities. You can see some examples here that are things like counseling sessions or classes, group classes, individual training, case management sessions, um, early care and education um, opportunities for people of different ages, some kind of health education. Again, it could be a class, it could be a one-on-one -on -one individual um, type of uh, session. Maybe you're providing vouchers or, or specific types of housing assistance or performances or events or advocacy work. All of these are things that you can point to, it matters less what exactly they are, but that you can demonstrate that they're activities that you have used those resources to produce. And sometimes outputs also involve not just activities, but specific um, individuals or groups of people. So there, this might be the population you're working with closely or hope to work with more in the future. There might be parents and caregivers, people of different ages, people representing different identities, um, people with different statuses in our society that are um, experiencing health inequities or well-being inequities in different ways. There might be staff inside your agency or in a partner agency that you're training in a new program or to expand a program. There might be other partners that you're working with or policymakers to try to change some of the systemic issues that we were talking about earlier that really affect equity and equitable outcomes. So this mix of activities and participants are the immediate outputs of what you are devoting your resources to. And then you are trying to do that for a purpose, right? You are devoting some resources, some energy, some time, some creativity to get to some kind of outcome. In the short term, the ones that are closest to you in time, you might be able to achieve some changes like the ones you see here, some increased awareness of something. Maybe you're changing some knowledge or understanding about a particular issue. Maybe you're hoping to move some attitudes um, and therefore some motivation to change or some confidence about being able to change a behavior, for example. And maybe you're offering some specific skills that incrementally lead to some of these more ambitious changes. But the idea behind short-term outcomes is that there are things that are happening soonish, and therefore they might be less ambitious and sweeping than the changes that you're going to achieve later on. And there's stepping stones to some of those more ambitious changes. And that's why you can see in the intermediate outcomes, if you have achieved those short-term changes, they're leading to these other changes that might be changes that are hard to achieve, like changes in behavior or status. Um, there might be things where you are leading to uh, different levels of connection across people who were formerly isolated from each other. Maybe there's literacy or housing stability, physical activity, water conservation, voter participation. These are things that take time to build up to, and that's why they are in the intermediate column. And then from those, you can build further to reach longer term outcomes. And these are changes, more underlying changes in the conditions, the circumstances, or the environment, like the core conditions that you saw Nicole Young review earlier. So these are um, these take more effort to achieve. They're usually not the things that one organization achieves on its own. So they require some collective work and some aligned work. And they are leading towards the impact 
that you are hoping for. And that's how they line up with your theory of change. They're, they're telling an audience about um, what you want to achieve and how you hope you will get there. So I'm going to stop the slide share for a second and switch back to another tool that we wanted to share with you that can help you define some of these outcomes if they're not immediately in your, um, in your materials or your thinking about your program at the moment. Give me just a second to get there. And let me share my screen. So again, on data share, going to the core results menu from that local progress tab. Oh, and we should mention too, um, all of this material on data share can be translated to other languages, including Spanish, French, and German. But on the core results menu, which we hope is a familiar graphic at this point, when you scroll down, you can see this highlighted connect strategies and program outcomes. And if you click on that, this will give you some language and some tools, whether you're working um, with a focus on people. I'll just scroll through a few of these. Organizations and systems. There's some examples here places and communities, public and political will, whatever path you choose through this tool, you can have some prompts in here about the types of short and longer term outcomes, intermediate outcomes that you might want to achieve. And these are really just exactly to get you started. So maybe you're looking for changes in awareness and you can see some examples here it's increased awareness about a particular issue among a particular audience or population. Um, so this is just if you're feeling stuck or you wanna see if there's another way to think about something you're already doing, this is a, a way to get unstuck and start thinking about some of the language and the types of things you could be looking at. And returning to our slides. One of the features of logic models is that they should ideally work in both directions, reading them from left to right, or in other words, from the inputs or resources all the way to your ultimate impact, or from right to left, from the impact backing up through the outcomes and to the activities and outputs. And this is sometimes referred to as backwards mapping, but you can start at one end here with the long-term outcomes. For example, youth are ready for life, college, and career. And then you might ask yourself, if we want youth to be ready for those things, what needs to happen before that? So that would be some of your intermediate outcomes. And then you would continue asking yourself, if that's going to be the case, then what do they need before that? What do they need to know or understand or be able to do in order to achieve those intermediate outcomes? And then you back up still further and say, in order to get to those shorter term outcomes, those changes in knowledge or understanding or skills, what do we need to have in place as more immediate activities in the short, really short term. So again, you can do this in either direction. You can start with the activities that you are thinking about or have planned and think very concretely about what they might lead to in the short term, the intermediate term and the long term, getting progressively more ambitious um, as you move out. Or you can start with the end in mind, what you hope to achieve, what's aspirational and back yourself up to what might be the activities that would ultimately lead to those. And you can assign your own timeframes to these. For example, you might say the activities are things that you're doing now or in the next year or so, 
Short term might be in a couple years or three years. Intermediate might be three to five years. And long term might be, let's say, a decade out. But this is going to vary for every program and every situation, depending on how ambitious your goals are and your outcomes, how complicated they are to achieve, and how much you've already got in place. So don't worry so much about what, what time frames belong to each column, but just know that they build on each other and the things that are closest to you in time are bound to be more specific and contained than the things that are further out on this logic model. Any questions before we dive into some practice? Okay, let's see how this might work for you. So again, if you happen to have the handouts handy, go ahead and use those. Or just grab a nearby piece of paper and jot down your answers to what you're doing and why. So if you had this set of resources in place, to do these activities for these participants, then you could expect or want or hope to see some changes, some short-term changes, some intermediate changes, and some long-term changes. And again, don't worry about nailing this the first time or the second or third time. It's an iterative process and it's just a thought process to get started thinking in this in this way. Does anyone want to share how this how this is going or how it went? Any examples of of outcomes or anything that was particularly challenging? Hi, my name is Danielle. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Danielle. Hi. Hey. Hi, thank you. Um, as I think through this, I'm beginning to be curious about how broad or narrow we might want to define our target population or our participants that are going to benefit. Um, so in the example that you gave, it was a pretty specific demographic. Um, it was, I think you said um, it was a Latino population that of young people that um, were not having access to um, or were not having good nutrition. I, I know I'm probably botching that a little bit, but oh, that, that's, what, that's if right in there. Yeah. what if you wanted to potentially impact um, more than one subset of a population? Would that be too complex for the scope of the proposal? Not necessarily. You know, I think that really depends on what it is that you're hoping to achieve, um, is it something similar for all of those different subgroups? And so, for example, just, just riffing on what you said, it, if you had an education program that you were going to deploy in different schools or different grades with different groups, um, or maybe it's something that, um, that applies, that has different content for, for for people of different genders or different ages um, or different situations, then you, you might say that you are, that's one of the th questions that you're trying to answer is, does the program have some universal outcomes associated with it, no matter who the, the participants are, or are there differences based on some of those factors? It really just depends on on what you're doing, but there's there's no reason to be either limited or broad. It's a, it's the match of the resources that you are seeking or have in place, your expectation for what outcomes are realistic for what you're doing, and how you are able to show that. So, if um, if your theory of change and logic model can help you explain that, 
that it's it's a program that's going to work with different populations or could work with different populations, great. Then, then the theory of change and logic model have helped you make that case. But alternatively, if going through this process of thinking through your assumptions and what leads to the next set of outcomes, if that feels fuzzy after you've done this or you can't, you feel like you can't really explain how that works, maybe that's telling you to pull back and focus more. So my advice would be to use these as a tool to help you decide how broad or narrow to be with your choice of population. Okay, thank you. And I think one thing, one way to go about it might be to have your short term um, outcomes be based on a narrower, narrower, narrower population and then potentially expand um, over a longer, uh, longer term course. Absolutely. I think that's a that's a very valid approach that, um, you know, programs that use um, like a pilot test um, often mm-hmm. are set up that way. You know, in the short term, we're going to test this or that. And there's another tool that um, the core um, continuum of results and evidence that we didn't highlight today, but will in a future training that can really help you think through exactly that. Um, Nicole, anything to hey. add, Crystal, to Danielle's question? And thanks for the question. Yeah, it's a good question because there's, I think, a few different ways that you could use a theory of change and logic model to answer or uncover different questions that then either make themselves make their way into a grant proposal or just uh, give you ideas about, oh, we need to explore this further. Um, Because I know sometimes programs and services um, are often designed for kind of a general population or like, you know, maybe like a specific age group, but not, not necessarily a particular, um, cultural group or racial group or, uh, you know, gender. And so sometimes a a logic model and asking the kinds of questions that you just asked, Danielle, can really help uh, uncover some of the thinking around, okay, this program might, we we might think it, uh, it might produce these kinds of short term outcomes. But will that be true for everybody? of different genders, of different races or ethnicities or different, um, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds. And sometimes you might say, well, we're not really sure. And so that's the thing that we are going to propose doing to really try that and test that and do some intentional specific outreach and, uh, you know, to, to make sure that we're reaching and serving a particular population so that we can test and see, does this program work as well um, for you know for these specific types of groups versus kind of a general general audience? And then that might inform your thinking about some of the activities that maybe there are different types of outreach or recruitment or even just ways of delivering the service um, that might look slightly different depending on again who you're trying to reach. So the just even going through the theory of change and logic model kind of thought process might help uh, uncover or shed light on some of those things, or at least just put a name to put a name to it in a place to keep track of that in your, in your tools. Yeah, no, thank you. I think you've given me a lot of insights there. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions or reactions, thoughts about using these tools? We, we've given you a lot of information, especially if you haven't seen these before. But like all of these tools, like we always say, they really, um, it, it will benefit you to spend some time with them, um, both to just play around and see what works and doesn't work, but also to do several iterations of them. Because if if you weren't here at the very beginning, when Nicole mentioned it's it's not it's not about getting perfection on the first try, um, and so they really can look very very different from the beginning, from the first try to the something that you are happier with or that makes more sense to others. Um, but that the idea of it as a process and something also that is never quite done. And I hate hate to say that, but 
they really do need to be revisited, as you can imagine, at different times because you have different assumptions and your um, your situation might change, your organization situation might change. And the good news is, as you start to achieve some of those outcomes, then you get to have new ones um, and move move forward. Oh, thanks for that comment. Jamie, it's helping you see things through a different lens and where you might have some holes when you tell funders about the program, particularly in terms of data. Yes, this is going back to the cartoon that, that Nicole shared at the outset. Anything that makes that, that magic black box, you know, more transparent, more clear, um, more, um, more compelling to, to funders, but not just funders different different kinds of support um, partners volunteers staff um, these are great tools for onboarding new staff for example here's what we're all about here's why we do what we do here's how you, your program fits in those kinds of things as well so I know I know we're here to talk about the core RFP and this is a specific application for that for figuring out um, what you what story you want to tell but they they also do have other uses. Anybody else? Oh, Christina, go ahead. I, see um, I just because I was looking at the strategies. I have an evidence-based program, this form that I've used for years for a program, and we we it always gives us the best results, and, and we've gotten real clear, like we really do show how much improvement we do in regards to our volunteers and the work that they do. And the, my whole thing right now is all about how do I word it <laughs> so I could get this point across and not end up with uh, words that make sense to me, but don't make sense to the funder. So thank you. You're welcome. And that's a great point that these things can help you um, figure out where there might be confusion about what you're doing. That's something that's totally clear to you, may not be clear to others. And Christina, I also wanna thank you for bringing up the example of an evidence-based program. Often those, one, one advantage of those, if you are implementing something that has already been um, tested in other settings and, and thoroughly evaluated, that's a great starting point for um, what outcomes are expected. And they may very well have a logic model in the materials that, that could be something that you tweak or think about differently um, or, or a theory of change. But often those are part of a, a packet of a, a curriculum or a program implementation guide or toolkit um, that can give you some ideas about what to measure and when um, if, you're, if you're implementing something like that. And also oh, yeah. you, can, you can look at others, other examples. Um, of if there's a similar program that's been implemented elsewhere, they may have done some of this work in thinking about outcomes and how to measure them and how to articulate them um, that you don't have to just come up with from scratch. Any other thoughts or ideas about theories of change or logic models? My dog has thoughts. <laughs> I'll just say I'm I'm really pleased to see some um, great comments in the in the chat about how this information is helpful and just hearing some of you express that as well because. You know, oftentimes it can feel like, oh, there's so many things to do. Like if a funder's not requiring it, I don't have time to do it. Uh, and so, you know, it's, I feel like it's pretty rare that a funder will actually require you to submit a logic model or a theory of change with a proposal. I've, I've, I've experienced that a few times where that's actually required. It's like, oh, great. I've got one. Um, but so the, you know, I, I, as you could probably tell, both Nicole and I are big believers in even if a funder isn't requiring it, if you can carve out that time to do it and make it almost like a regular habit and, and dialogue, the more prepared you'll be 
you know, to respond to whether it's core or whether it's a different grant application, because you'll have some ready language and you'll have fleshed out that thinking about, you know, why you do what you do and, and not just, you know, because it's important because it's needed, but to really be able to back that up with some, um, some good data and stories. Yeah. And Nicole, can I just quickly add, yeah. uh, um, we're going under um, a whole kind of rebranding process and we are needing to redo our website. Um, you were talking about, you know, where this could be applicable. I, I have to say um, it's become evident to me that if we can identify and nail these theories of change and logic model down, how important it is to incorporate that into our website to give a quick viewer some information and we can actually, you know, with some slight tweaking can actually use it on our general collateral material. Um, so we're really diligently back here at the diversity center, really looking at this and intend to have really solid pieces here because I, as you were trying to allude to, I, I do think it permeates everything you do and it makes life so much easier. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. And, you know, I think sometimes you'll see on a web page something that sounds like a logic model or a theory of change. It's not called that. It might say <clears throat> the ultimate impact that we that we're about, that, you know, that we our purpose is or what we want to achieve is and the way that we do it is and the way you can help us do it is. <laughs> Um, and or, we know this because right we know this that, because those it. have been the most so we've had to like look at various websites and whatnot those have been the most impactful websites and that's what impacted me but I actually frankly don't mind when there's tabs that say our theory of change our logic wow. model our impact you know just really putting it out there and, and with no with, with strong have... languaging yeah go on more time there's no reason not to have both the language that no, you're talking no, about and the no. tabs and the mm -hmm. tables and the diagrams. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's really um, like Nicole said, it's a thought process. So the, the, the completed grid, the tools, the questions, the answers, it's reflecting that you've been thinking about what you're doing and that you are able to say why you think this is the approach that's going to be effective so that's that's the value of it that you have um, thought that through, and you have a way to convince others that you've thought it through. Um, and unfortunately, just you know, sometimes we think that we've done that, and it's just not really the case. So this is just to help you ask yourself those questions, ask others. Um, you know, I think you may have mentioned. Um, Jamie, I think you mentioned in your chat comment, realizing there's some holes in how you explain things to others. So if there are people around your organization, board members, some other supporters, volunteers, um, you can ask them to, to be your test case for talking through some of these things and seeing how those are compelling. Oh, thanks, Melanie, for the website too. Um, there, there are lots of ways to to keep this um, conversation going and refining the materials that you come up with. Nicole, I'm thinking that uh, I'm going to try this again to do our closing poll. Okay. Before we wrap up here, and then I know we've got a couple other details we want to share on the last slides there. We do. Let's see. Um, okay. So <laughs> can you yeah. see the poll? I can see it. Okay. But I am a co Okay, now I see responses coming through. That's so weird uh -huh. that that happened the first time. <laughs> it's just one of those days. <laughs> okay, let me put the poll slide up. I can do that. I hope I have. Whoops. Let's see. Yeah, so now, now we're asking the same question. How would you rate your level of knowledge about developing a theory of change and also a logic model? And how likely are you to develop a theory of change with a logic model after today's training? And you're seeing answers, Nicole? I'm seeing answers now, yeah. Awesome, okay. 
Maybe it's that maybe that's why my computer had to restart suddenly. <laughs> maybe. My laptop was concerned that I could not see the poll earlier. It's 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 reading the mood. Yeah. Okay, it looks like maybe responses have slowed down. So I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. Okay. You seeing the results there? So some quite a few some level of knowledge one a lot and this is nice to see several of you saying you're very likely to develop a theory of change with a logic model after today so love to see that and uh, again feel free during office hours or TA sessions to let us know if you want any additional help with that um, and in our last few minutes here, we do want to just cover a few more details just to uh, let you know there are a lot of opportunities coming up to receive more training technical assistance, both in group settings and uh, more individualized settings over the next couple of months. So um, I think Gisela has put the link to the core events website in the chat again. That is probably the easiest place to go to, even though it's also listed on HSD's website. Um, this is our the core website that we maintain. It's probably the easiest place to just see the full list, see all the links, um, including the, the link to sign up for your initial TA session. And then uh, on Tuesday, we have one of our regular core coffee chats that we're actually hosting in collaboration with the Diversity Center and Data Share on best practices in data collection and sharing, focusing specifically on sexual orientation and gender identity or SOGI data. So we are really excited about that one. And we encourage you to sign up for that as well if you want to just kind of uh, get some tips, but also check to see, oh, how are we collecting that data? How are we asking for that data from our program participants? Um, so those are the upcoming Court Institute events. On the next slide, you'll see our um, links to the feedback survey for today's training. Gisela will also put those in the chat, or if you have a um, smartphone with a camera app and you want to scan the QR code, you can answer the feedback survey in English or Spanish. We really do appreciate any and all feedback about the trainings. Uh, it will help us fine tune things over the, over the next several events. And then last but not least, we still are administering our Core Institute survey. It's kind of a broader survey to gather feedback about existing Core Institute events, as well as getting a better understanding of other types of training and capacity building needs. Um, our colleague, Crystal Caballero, who I see is on the call, helped, helped us develop that one. And so it's still an active survey. Um, it'll be open through the end of day on June 12th. The first 100 people who complete the survey, like complete all the required questions, will receive a Visa gift card. So I'm not sure if we've reached our 100 yet or if there's still room for the to earn that Visa card, but I encourage you to click on the link or, again, scan the QR code to, um, to provide your feedback in that survey. So we will hang out here for a few more minutes in case anybody has some final questions. And I think that is it.